uh, uh, it's a brain, uh, uh, it could be one of the indications. Uh, I know uh, uh, people are using uh, the same thing. If they co are causing it sclera is thick, you make a scleral window, then all the same is uh, the choroid is thick, the pattern. Why not make, make a scleral window? But only the time will tell. Theoretically, it sounds good. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And with that, I'm going to now invite my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Shema Rajan Singh, and he's going to be giving us uh, his presentation on endogenous and ophthalmitis, something that we unfortunately have a lot more of in this COVID and post-COVID era. Dr. Shema, please. Thank you. Thank you, sir, and thank you for having me in this course. So, uh, talking of endogenous and ophthalmitis, it is one of the severest forms of inflammation we can have in the eye. It is secondary to hematogenous spread of microorganisms and constitutes about 2 to 8 percent of endothelmitis and recently it has been an increased number with the COVID going on as Dr. Mohit just said. So an important thing to know is that uh, whenever we have a, we have to suspect endogenous endothelmitis when there is no antecedent trauma or antecedent surgery in the case and the patient presents with the inflammation in the eye. And not all the cases that are going to come to you are going to be very sick or hospitalized. The majority of them will actually just walk into your clinic and will have inflammation in the eye. And not all will have a very red eye also. You may have to, so you have to be really suspicious that yes, it's a case of endogenous endothelitis. Risk factors, recent hospitalization, very important. We have to look for the source of immunocompromise. Where is it coming from? Is it diabetes? It is long-term steroid use some autoimmune disorders, HIV or malignancy. Diabetes and HIV are very common and they are often, the history is often not forthcoming. So you have to look for it, investigate for it and search the cause. And along with in India and especially in the part that I come from Punjab, IV drug abuse and IV infusions for very trivial illnesses are very common. They will have fever, they will go get a dextrose infusion and usually that will be infected fungal and that is a problem. And we did report this uh, from our center earlier, where they actually found the fungal uh, growth in the dextrose bottles from the area that the patients were coming from. So etiology-wise, it can be bacterial or fungal. Uh, the gram-negative bacterial are the most severe, uh, amongst them Klebsiella, Pseudomonas, and E. coli. Gram-positive are more commoner and actually the commonest cause of endogenous endothelmitis, Streptococcus and Staphylococcus. And fungal is something that we uh, have problems dealing with. They could be yeast or molds, and candida and aspergillus are the uh, two types in that. So it's important to differentiate candida from aspergillus from their clinical picture. <laughs> and the candida usually have a longer history and an indolent course. The patient could be admitted, and they could have an indolent catheter. So these are the most common indications. And they may be misdiagnosed as uveitis. The patient may just present with some vitritis and some white fluffy balls in the vitreous and nothing else. So they may be misdiagnosed as some autoimmune or other kind of uveitis. And it prefers the vitreous for growth. So that is very important. We'll find it more in the vitreous than in the subretinal space. And they may do well with the systemic and the oral antifungals and uh, have a better functional outcome. Aspergillus or moles on the other hand have a short and aggressive course. It's very common to mistake them with bacterial endo endogenous endothelmitis and they are mostly associated with the immunocompromise of some sort. And they prefer the subretinal and the sub-RP space for growth and then come into the vitreous. And they respond better to vitrectomy and often because they are already caused scarring in the subretinal space, they have a poorer functional outcome. So whenever you get suspect the case of endogenous endothelmitis, it is important to not be, let the patient go away. Preferably keep him indoor if he comes from far away. Send blood cultures and urine cultures for three continuous days. And the first culture should go before you start your uh, antifungals or any other antimicrobials. Blood sugars and blood counts and HIV again for to rule out all the risk factors and the cause for immunocompromise. And vitreous and AC cap depending on how the inflammation is. Systemic antimicrobials may be start with prophylactic uh, broad spectrum initially looking at the picture whether it is bacterial or fungal and along with intravital and then get targeted microbiology and treat accordingly. The protein is being more and more used these days uh, because we have better instrumentation and we can get better results in a short
shorter period of time. So I'm just going to be talking of three scenarios that we commonly face in the clinic. One is endogenous fungal endophthalmitis. So this is a very classical presentation of endogenous fungal endophthalmitis that you'll see. Bilateral you can see at the posterior pole yellowish fluffy lesions and uh, on the OCT if you look at it this one uh, you can actually see the breach in the RPE it came from the choroid and it's just coming out into the vitreous. So it's trying to come to the vitreous and it's bang at the macula. And in the left eye also at the posterior pole again breaking through from the choroid but just sparing the foveal region along the inferior temporal quadrant. And you can see a satellite lesion over here also again. So this is a 45 year old diabetic hypertension man treated for fever, dysuria, uncontrolled blood sugar. So all the risk factors going for endogenous endophthalmitis. We initially admitted and treated with prophylactic antifungals and also intravitreal antifungals. Urine culture was positive for candida and was sensitive to the azole group of drugs. So was given voriconazole, IV as well as intravitreal. The right eye as you can see is responding better. And since it was already involved in the phobia, this is bound to end up with scarring right here at the center. The left eye hadn't responded as much as we had expected, so we took that eye up for surgery. And also because it was still sparing the phobia and we did not want any healing and scarring to happen over there to affect the phobia. So after clearing out the vitreous, I'm trying to detach the hyaloid uh, from that area. And you can see that satellite lesion, it was full thickness retinal and kind of the retina forming a break over there. So but it's essential to detach the hyaloid from all around this so that you can ultimately tamponade it. So you go around that lesion and detach the hyaloid and kind of trim out the infected area. We are actually eating that away over there and that will be the end of it. So, since this inferior temporal lesion was just one dish diameter from the fovea, I prefer to do island peel to prevent any future traction onto the fovea. And that also allowed me to remove some of this material which was lying under the island. Now it was involving the full thickness of the retina. And that was about it, did a flare wire exchange and laser around the inferior satellite lesion because there was now a break over there. And finished the case with a uh, gas tamponade. So the patient did well. The right eye you can see it's kind of scarred over there now. And the left eye, uh, this is the OCT passing through the lesion and you can see that that lesion has now kind of subsided and the fovea is fine and the patient did well after that. And in fact improved to about 618 in the left eye subsequently after the completion of treatment. So second scenario is endogenous bacterial endophthalmitis which may sometimes present very fulminantly. So this was a 22 year old female complained of low vision for 20 days post delivery. So we could not find the source initially, we were looking for the source and then while she was admitted in the ward, she uh, said that she, uh, it pains when the baby sucks for the uh, lactation. So then we saw the nipple and we could see a cracked nipple and actually pus over there and that pus that was sent for culture reveals staph aureus and also the vitreous revealed the same organism. It was sensitive to vancomycin and the patient was subsequently treated with intravitreal as well as systemic vancomycin and you can see the course of healing along and as is very common in such cases the hyaloid is subsequently going to detach because of the inflammation in the eye. The patient had a retinal detachment after the hyaloid detached with a horseshoe tear over here which was subsequently treated with vitrectomy and a gas tamponade. But because of the scarring, the visual gain was modest. And you can see the uh, OCT of the fovea with the infection reduced but the scarring remaining. The third scenario which I personally see very commonly seeing a lot of ROP babies is neonatal endogenous endophthalmitis. It can have two kinds of presentation. The first one is a very fulminant kind that the parents actually themselves bring to you. And you can see this eye is completely yellow, severely inflamed and with a T sign on ultrasound. So this is in panophthalmitis actually. And it's very difficult to salvage these eyes, we are usually not able to. It's important to examine the other eye for any focal lesions in that. The second kind of presentation is a focal endogenous endophthalmitis and that is most commonly incidentally detected when you are screening for other disorders and 
more commonly for ROP as you can see the side, this also has a stage over here and then he presented stage 2 along with this focal lesion and this one was right at the phobia. So these kind of cases usually do well with treatment, this one of course because the phobia is going to be scarred but still you can manage them and majority can be managed with intravitreous and but if required surgery can be done. And it's important to note that like such a case, whenever you are given intravitreous, it may be pertinent not to suck too much of the vitreous because the vitreous is very formed in these cases and tends to leave a drag on the fovea and uh, altered anatomy after that. So sampling can be done with vitrectomy better and you can just inject the intravitreous. So these two spectrum have been reported from this uh, study from LV Prasad Eye Institute also. So just concluding the Indian perspective, how it's different from the Western, what Western literature reports. We have a, uh, the, we have a younger age of presentation and the underlying cause cannot be found in a majority of our cases. Bacterial do form the majority of the cases with Klebsiella being very important, especially in hepatobiliary infection. And fungal infections should be kept in mind in cases with immunocompromised and IV dextrose infusions. Our yield from urine and blood cultures is usually poor because the patient often gets some treatment and then comes to you. So they are already under some antimicrobial, so they are not treatment nice. And early vitrectomy is increasingly being used for us because it gives a quicker result and better resolution of the infection. And a lot of the data that I presented comes from these two landmark trials that were published a couple of years ago in the Indian Journal. So I would recommend going through that for the Indian scenario of endogenous endophthalmitis. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great talk. I think the, uh, for me the, the second last slide in which we compared both of the, you know, uh, what's the, the public literature and the Indian perspective is very, very important. And before I pose a question to you, I would just like to, you know, share one important point with the audience, which we already did, but just to drive home that for most part, uh, mo you know, the general teaching is that an endo that endogenous endophthalmitis patient is systemically sick, systemically unwell, might be in, in the ICU, in the wheelchair, you know, not doing well. Yes, that's true, but that's not the whole truth because you have a distinct subset of patients who will walk into your clinic, they will be asymptomatic, their PLCs will be normal, you will have no evidence, they'll be fit, fine and healthy, they'll be young individuals, but they will have endogenous endophthalmitis, generally unilaterally, and that is secondary to contaminated either IV infusion fluid related, uh, you know, in, you know so, so they get a bolus somewhere and that goes and sits in the eye. And once that infection has gone through the co chorioretinal barrier, it gets stuck. It has no way to go but to try and eat away the eye from, from inside. So these people will be walking into your clinic. They will not be sick. They will not have systemic issues. And they need surgery because there is that bolus of infection which sat in their eye that needs to be taken out. The other one, the other group, which is the period and optimizer, the sick patients, since it's a systemic infection causing an uh, uh, ocular problem, cornerstone of therapy is systemic antibiotics slash antifungals and intravitreal therapy but with a very, very low threshold for vitrectomy given the condition of the patient if it permits or not. Because lots of times they will be in the ICU, they will be very, you know, they will have other comorbidities, there will be no clearance, you will not be able to wheel them up into the OT. So to till that time, especially if it's a bilateral process, injecting in both the eyes and trying to keep the eye uh, in a state where we can operate later on once the systemic condition improves, is of paramount importance. So I think that is very, very important. Um, I'm just going to ask one question uh, similar uh, in, the, uh, in the interest of time. And this is uh, regarding if, you're fresh, uh, so, uh, if you suspect fungal endogenous endophthalmitis based on your clinical experience or what you see in the, in the eye, um, it, you know, let's say the vision is pretty good, 6, 12, 6, 18, um, you know, patient just has some floaters, maybe some stringless pearls. Would you, uh, what is your threshold for the vitrectomy there? Is it acuity dependent? Is it dependent on other factors? It is similar. Is your, is your choice process similar to a patient having an ERM with a particular thing or with you uh, differ? Uh, I part. think it's dependent on where the uh, lesion is sir, and how much the quantum of inflammation is. So if the vitreous is going to be filled up with that thing and I'm not able to have a good view, I'll operate right away. So in the other case, if the lesion is kind of peripheral and you think you can treat it with systemic, I would treat it with systemic, but if it's closer to the phobia, I will uh, intervene right away. So that's the kind of thing that's deciding uh, when to intervene in these cases, and especially if there is no response with systemic, you would want to intervene. Yeah. Yeah. So, no, 
I have a question for you. Great talk. Uh, uh, this is um, uh, from the general ophthalmologist. Uh, uh, whenever I am seeing a case of endogenous endocrinitis, uh, if I have to uh, do uh, tap and inject, so uh, what do you prefer? I should add antifungal in that or I should wait for the results? So I personally do add if I suspect it clinically. Uh, it's not, there is no consensus on that, that we would give prophylactic antifungal. But if I suspect clinically it is fungal, I will add antifungal in the tap. And uh, which will that be? Which antifungal you will use? Still prefer amphotericin B6. Uh, uh -huh. Still has a wider spectrum. But yes, we would want to get a culture sensitivity and no, as in, I showed this case which had candida and it was sensitive to only the rose and it was... So you will give to the ampho, chesta, and ampho and dexa. And ampho and dexa. All four you will give. All four. All right. Thank you. Uh, just one question, please, please. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Sure, uh, actually, I have one question. Which we have a uh, focal lesion in the uh, band in the posterior. Still, uh, would you go for a vitreous tap, but the yield will be very low and it will cause some drag and there may be some complications. I agree. So that, that is why I said it depends where the inflammation is. Yeah. So usually there are cells that uh, spurt out into the vitreous and that is what we are trying to collect. So that is why I said in, in neonatal cases, especially the vitreous is very firm. So where you are putting the tap, your yield is very low and the vitreous is not going to come in yeah. and your uh, growth will also be very low. So that is why I said in those cases, it may not be advisable to take a tap that way. But in adults where the vitreous is a little bit liquefied and all that, and if you see vitreous cells on your clinical examination, I would take a